All right. Well, if you have a copy of God's Word this morning, I would invite you to open to Matthew. Matthew chapter 13. We'll be looking at Matthew chapter 13 all the way through chapter 14, excuse me, verse 12. And I'm going to not spend seven hours on it. I know some of you are thinking, oh my goodness. No, we're going to look at these things. All right, so after the, I mean, uh, across the past several weeks, uh, we have been looking at these kingdom parables. Uh, they have shown largely that there is a, a separation that is between those who are king, the, the citizens of the kingdom of God and those who are the citizens of the kingdom of the world, the kingdom of man, or the kingdom of, of Satan. They have shown lots of different facets. Of course, they have shown the worth of the kingdom, the infinite value of the kingdom, uh, the importance of, of, of hearing and believing the gospel of Jesus Christ so that you can become a citizen of the kingdom, but by and large, they have shown to show that there is, or they have uh, shown that there is a separation in the world, that the world is divided between two different types of people: those who are Christians, those who hear the message, they repent of, of their sins, and they believe the gospel, and they are saved, and those who do not, those who are headed for heaven, who belong to the kingdom of God, and those who are headed to hell in their sins. So this morning, we are going to see two case studies of those who. Do not. We're going to see the Nazarenes from Jesus' hometown, and then we're going to see the evil, uh, wicked King Herod. So I think Matthew has two objectives uh, with these two stories coming immediately after the kingdom parables. One is to show why Jesus is sort of leaving the region there in Capernaum, and he is heading uh, what will ultimately lead him into Jerusalem towards the cross. But it shows that there is a movement in Jesus' ministry. It's this sort of closing off in Matthew's gospel and sort of this restart again, uh, not so much that it is disconnected from the rest, it's just sort of a movement in the scripture and these two stories sort of illustrate or give us an understanding of that. The second thing that it does is it serves as two case studies on those who uh, would have the hard heart, like, the, like the, the hard soil that we talked about in the parable of the soils. It's showing those who do not believe the gospel, those who will not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So these are serving as two illustrations, if you will, of the truths of what these kingdom parables have been revealing throughout the entire section that we have been walking through. So this morning we are going to look at these two stories together. We're going to sort of walk through them and then at the end we're going to pull out four things that I want us to see. Two for those who do not know Christ and two for those of us who do know Christ. So let's read Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 53, all the way through chapter 14, verse 12. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there. And coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers, James and Joseph, and Simon and Judas, and are, are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him, but Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own ho household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. At that time Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod, so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. Now let's pray and ask God's blessing upon his word. Our Father in heaven, God, our Bibles are open and we pray that through your spirit you might open our hearts and our minds to hear what your word would say to us this morning. Father, we pray that in this narrative section of Matthew that you would reveal truths to us 
truths that can be applied directly to our lives. For those who don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, Father, I pray that for them they may hear and understand the message of the gospel and they may repent of their sins and believe in Jesus for salvation. For those of us who do know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, Father, help us to persevere even when things are difficult. Father, this morning we are clay in your hands and we pray that you will mold us and make us. Lord, transform us by the renewing of our minds according to your word and the power of your spirit. Lord, we love you and thank you. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the first group that we're going to see here are the astonished yet unbelieving. The astonished yet unbelieving. Look at verse 53. When Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there. The there in this context is Capernaum. This has been his home base for an extended period of time. And now he is leaving there and he is going to, to Nazareth. And so he goes to his hometown and he taught them in their synagogue. And look at this. They were astonished and they were astonished about two things. Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works. Is this not the carpenter's son and the Mary's son and his brothers and sisters? They all still live with us today. Where then did this man get all these things? So the people were astonished. They were astonished at the wisdom of Jesus, the way that he expounded the scriptures. This is something that runs throughout all of the gospel narratives. As many people, as they hear Christ's teaching, even if they don't believe in Him for salvation, they are astonished that someone who is unlearned, someone who is the son of a carpenter, who is a carpenter himself, can have such wisdom and insight into the things of God. Remember when we were walking through the Sermon on the Mount, it said that they were astonished because He was teaching them as one who had authority, not like their scribes and their Pharisees, not like the teachers of the law that they had known. So there was something that was peculiar about Jesus' teaching ministry. He had insights that other people didn't. He understood the nature of the kingdom of God in a way that these Pharisees didn't. And you remember what we talked about last time, that it is those who are Christians who can bring out of the Old Testament and the New Testament these new and old treasures. Remember, Jesus is himself the king who was to come. He is the king who ushered in the kingdom of God. He is God himself, the second member of the Trinity. So, of course, they were astonished at his teaching. The second thing is they were astonished at his mighty works. And I want you to hear that. They were astonished that he was able to perform miracles. They were astonished that he had the power to do the things that he was doing. You see, it's curious to me that as you go throughout the gospel accounts, the Pharisees who hated Christ had to acknowledge that he was doing mighty works. The Nazarenes who did not believe in Christ had to, had to acknowledge that he was able to perform miracles. Herod the Tetrarch, who was himself an evil, wicked man, had to acknowledge that there were miraculous things that were happening with Christ. So even those who would not acquiesce to the knowledge of Christ, to the knowledge of the gospel, even those who rejected the kingdom of God, still had to acknowledge that Jesus was one who would taught as one who had authority and one who did the mighty miracles like the prophets of old. But that didn't necessarily lead them to salvation, did it? See, the people couldn't get past their own preconceived notions of who Christ is. Look what they said. Is not this the carpenter's son? In Mark chapter 6, verse 3, it says, Is this not the carpenter? Perhaps Matthew is thinking too highly of Christ as his main focus has been to show that Jesus is, in fact, the king of kings who would come to say that he was a carpenter. But we would understand that the one who was the son of a carpenter would follow after his father's trade. So his dad was the carpenter. And his son indeed was as well. Now, carpentry then in that context could also mean someone who was a stonemason. So he was a construction worker. They can't understand how he's able to do these things. They said, is he not the carpenter? Doesn't his, doesn't his mother still live here? Isn't his mother still, still here? Isn't his mother named Mary? And his brothers and sisters, like, don't they still live here? And just as a side note, for those who believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary, these sorts of passages have a real problem, right? This is 
Not something that would seem like Mary had no other children, right? This is something that shows that Christ indeed at least had half-brothers and sisters that were known to people in Nazareth. And so they say, well, yes, but those were from Joseph from a different, from a different marriage or from a different woman. Well, that's pushing a lot into something here. That's taking something beyond the context of what the Scripture would say. This is them bringing their own presuppositions and their own preconceived notions of who Mary is into a text. Jesus had half-brothers and half-sisters. And they say, isn't, isn't they, aren't they here? Like, can't we see them? Can't we, can't we know them? I mean, they knew what he was doing. But he was doing things that were impossible for a human. They could hear the wisdom and they understood that that was in fact the wisdom of God. That he had wisdom beyond what anything a normal human could have. But they couldn't believe what he said. They refused to acknowledge that he was, in fact, who he said he was. And by the way, this touches on both characters or both attributes of Christ. His deity, that he had the wisdom of God, he was able to do mighty works that no one else could do. But also his humanity. The fact that whenever they looked at him, they saw someone who was, who was like them. Not a sinner, of course, but someone who was really human. Someone who learned to trade. Someone who was the son of a carpenter. And this speaks of Jesus' humanity. We always have to remember that because of Jesus' humanity, He is able to identify us as sinful creatures, identify with us, rather, as sinful creatures, which He did at His baptism. And He was able to die at a death that could atone for our sins precisely because He was human. But remember, He was sinless because He was God. You see, this is a unique thing that is happening right in front of them. It's the exact same thing that was happening in front of the Pharisees as they were attributing his power to the power of Satan. In fact, it says they took offense at him in verse 57. Where did this man get these things? How does he do them? He, he's just, he looks just like us. How can these things be possible? So they were offended by him. They were offended by the fact that he said he was their long-awaited Messiah. Christian, listen, there are people all over the world who believe in Jesus and are not saved. There are people all over the world who believe in someone named Jesus and they are not saved at all. You see, every other false religion, nearly every other false religion, believes that Jesus was a good man. They will say he was a good teacher. They will acquiesce to the fact that he was able to have the wisdom of God. He was a good teacher. Some of them, like Islam, would say that he was even a prophet. That he was someone who was, in fact, able to do these mighty works that he said he was able to do. Or, they believe in a Jesus who they create in their own minds. In our own context, with the Mormons and Jehovah's Witness, they don't believe that Jesus is God. They don't believe that he's the second member of the Trinity. They believe that Jesus is a created being, just like us. He was the first created being. Well, I'll tell you the belief in a Jesus who does not exist, like they do, or an unbelief in the Jesus who does exist, will land you in the same place. You're either going to believe in the Jesus of the Bible as revealed by God's Word, or you're going to go to hell. You see, just because someone tells you, yes, I believe in a Jesus, does not mean that they are a Christian. In fact, I would say, someone that believes in a Jesus of their own invention is in a far worse place than someone who believes in it or doesn't believe in Jesus at all because they think they are okay. They think they are saved. They think because they know something about Jesus that they will be okay with God. But look at the Nazarenes. They knew Jesus. When he walked into town, they said, there's Jesus. They knew Jesus' family. They knew Jesus' wisdom. They knew Jesus' power to work miracles. And what does it say? They were filled with unbelief. And I'll tell you, whenever you confront someone with the Jesus of the Bible, whether they are religious or whether they are irreligious, and they are offended by that Jesus, well, my Jesus would never the Jesus I believe in would never. When they are offended by the Jesus of the Bible, 
they are revealing that they are not, in fact, saved. Whoever would take offense at me, whoever would deny me before men, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Now there's two things that happen in Nazareth, and both of them are negative. And both of them are due to their hardness of heart. Jesus tells them that a prophet is not without honor. You see in verse 57, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. Now I think that Matthew is including that specific Part, or part of it, not only because Jesus said that, but also to connect this story with the next one where there will be another prophet who is treated shamefully by King Herod. So he says that a prophet is not without honor. So these people, these two illustrations, these two case studies, they reject, they reject God himself who is speaking for God and they, re they reject the man who comes to speak on behalf of God. And then it says that Jesus did not do mighty or many mighty works there. Now, if you're a careful reader of the Bible, you will see in Mark chapter 6, verse 5, that Mark chapter 6, verse 5 says he could do no mighty works there. So some people see a contradiction between what Mark says, that he could do no mighty works, and what Matthew says, that he did not do many mighty works. And they say, aha, look, it's a contradiction. Well, if you just keep reading a little bit, at the end of that verse, it says, except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. So both Matthew and Mark are telling us that he didn't do many mighty works there, but he did in fact do some miracles in the place where he was, in Nazareth. Some faith healers of today will take this verse along with some other ones and they will say, this is why I wasn't able to heal you. This is why I was unable to, you do not believe, you do not have enough faith that God can do miracles. So you can't be healed. And that is the ultimate cop-out for a fake teacher, for a false teacher, for one of these false prophets or these false faith healers that you see on TV that are curing people of, of, of chronic headaches or of, of some unseen back pain that they have paid somebody to acquiesce to in the back. You see, they put them on TV, but whenever someone who really does have a problem comes to them and says, why can't you heal me? They say, it's because you don't have enough faith. Look to Matthew chapter 13. Not even Jesus could do very many miracles there because of their unbelief. We've all heard it. Now, are they right? Well, no. If you've been around me long enough, you know that I absolutely detest false teachers, and I cannot stand false faith healers. I can't stand them. They lead people away from God, not to God. They are blinded by their own greed and power, and they are a, a disease within the Christian body that has caused so much harm that it is spreading across the entire globe. Now, in the context, can we make sense of what Jesus is saying? Well, yes, we can. The first is, it's not the amount of faith that you have, it's who you put your faith in that matters. It's not the amount of faith that you have, it's who you put your faith in that matters. The second thing is, Matthew is not trying to show us that if there is unbelief, God is somehow not able to do miracles. Think about this from a biblical theological standpoint. To say something like that is absolute blasphemy. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Did God have to have the faith of his created beings to create them? No, the answer is no. He did not have to have the faith of his created beings to create them. Did God have to have the faith of the Israelites to part the Red Sea? No. What did the Israelites say? Why did you lead us out here? We should have just stayed in Egypt. Now we're all going to die. That doesn't sound like much faith to me. Did God have to have the faith of his created beings to feed them with manna? Did the Israelites have faith? What did the Israelites say? Moses, we're hungry. We should have stayed in Egypt. We're all going to die. What about whenever God is bringing Jesus into the world? Or whenever Jesus is walking through these various things, whenever Jesus feeds the 5,000, did Jesus have to ask the people for their faith before he was able to multiply the loaves and the fish? Of course not. 
Do you think God is going to need the faith of His created beings to judge the whole world? Do you think God is going to need the faith of His created beings to create a new creation in heaven and earth? Do you think God is going to need the faith of His created beings to glorify their bodies? Do you think that God has to have the faith of His created beings to heal someone when He created the entire cosmos when you did not even exist? That's ridiculous. You see, if you really stop and think about it, then this can't even be the case because God is sovereign. We are not. If God needs us to do something in our lives, then that means that we are sovereign. We are the ones who are in control, not God. Also, notice in the immediate context, so it doesn't just make sense, I mean, does not make sense from a biblical theological standpoint. Look at the immediate context. They believed that Jesus could do miracles. That was part of the problem. Look what they say. They were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom? And how does he do these mighty works? You see, it wasn't that Jesus couldn't do miracles that was the problem. The problem for them was that Jesus was doing miracles, but they didn't have a platform to be able to understand someone who could heal the sick and had the power to raise the dead. You see, it wasn't their unbelief that caused Jesus not to be able to do miracles, as in Jesus needed their faith to be able to do it. The problem is not that they had a lack of faith that Jesus could do miracles. The problem is they did not believe in Him as the Messiah. That's their unbelief. They knew full well, just like Herod knows, that Jesus is able to perform miracles. The problem is they refuse to believe that He is the Messiah. So what does this mean? Well, we have to couch their unbelief in what it is first. It's not that Jesus can do miracles. It's not that God can heal the sick. They knew full well that God could heal the sick. They believed that God could. It was that they rejected Jesus as their Messiah. Some think that what Matthew and Mark are getting at is that they did not come to him to be saved and healed. So he didn't do many miracles like in other places where he would show up and they would bring all of the sick to him. Just like we're going to see in the next couple of sections. They will bring people to him and he will heal them. So some think that the reason why he wasn't able to do many miracles because of their unbelief is because they just didn't come to him for salvation and to be healed. Others believe, and I tend to think this, that it was an act of both judgment and mercy. That it wasn't God's will for him to continue to do many miracles there. And so Christ did not do many miracles there because he wasn't going to waste his time on hard-hearted individuals. If you wanted to put it in layman's terms, God does not simply do miracles to please the curiosity of these hard-hearted unbelievers. It doesn't happen. God didn't do that then. God doesn't do that now. So it was an act of judgment that Jesus did not continue to do the miracles in the place where they were rejecting him as the Messiah. And it was an act of mercy because remember, every sign, every miracle that he does in their presence in his hometown is only adding to their guilt because of their unbelief. Remember the Pharisees. Remember the Pharisees. You are about to be guilty of blaspheming the Holy Spirit because you are seeing the things that I am doing. You know that they are wondrous acts. You know that they are coming from God. And yet you are attributing my power to something other than God himself. And he says, for that you will never be forgiven. So it's possible that not only was it an act of judgment, but it was also an act of mercy. For him not to continue, because the more light that you have, the worse it will be for you. But the important thing for us to understand here, and the important thing that I want us to see going forward that will tie in at the end is, these were the people who were astonished at Christ, and yet were totally, totally lost. Well, what about the second camp? These are the evil, the sorry, and the unrepentant. The evil, the sorry, and the unrepentant. I know that sounds like the title of a soap opera, and it should, because what we're going to read about sounds like a script for a straight out of one. Look at verse 1 of chapter 14. It says, At that time Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist who has been raised from the dead. That is why these miracles, these miraculous powers, or work at him. So in verses 1 and 2, Matthew is telling us how Herod responded to the ministry of Christ and the message of the kingdom. 
In verses 3 through 12, he's going to tell us the story about John the Baptist being killed. Now, this is a flashback that we're about to read. This is him giving us a, a brief explanation that is expounded in further, uh, further in different Gospels. But this is not happening chronologically at the moment. This is something that happened in the past. So let's read verse 3. For Herod had seized John, bound him, and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias. Sounds like his name, right? Herod Herodias. That's going to make sense here in just a second. His brother Philip's wife. Also going to make sense here in just a second. Because John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people. Because they held him to be a prophet. Now in other gospel contexts we learn that he also respected John and knew that he was a righteous man. So he goes on and he says here, uh, that, but when Herod's birthday came, now birthdays were not a Jewish concept. Jewish people did not celebrate birthdays. Pagans celebrated birthdays in that, in that time. The daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with celebrating your birthday. So that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on the platter. And the king was sorry. See that? The evil and the sorry yet unrepentant. But because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother, and his disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and they told Jesus. All right, so we can see from the story that John the Baptist has been confronting Herod about his new wife and their unlawful marriage. Notice that the Bible still says his brother Philip's wife. Leviticus chapter 18 verse 16 says, You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. So John the Baptist is bringing the word of God to bear on this evil king's life. Now I want us to fill in some dots as best we can. And I will admit that the details are even a bit shaky for me. So who is this Herod? Well, Herod, this Herod is Herod Antipas. He is the son of Herod the Great. Which he should be called Herod the Evil, the first Herod. Herod Antipas is the son of Herod the Great. Now Herodias, who is the wife of Herod in this story, Herod Antipas, she is actually the daughter of Aristobulus. Okay, so who is Aristobulus? Well, Aristobulus was another one of Herod's sons. Another one of Herod's sons. So if you're following along, yes, Herodias, his first husband, Philip I, and another one of Herod's, Herod Antipas, they are in fact her uncles. So Herodias, who is the daughter of Aristobulus, Marries Philip I, who is her uncle. Herod, Antipas, and Philip I are brothers, half-brothers. So Herod, Antipas, goes to visit Philip I and his bride. While he's there, they fall in love. Now, there is a problem here because Herod is married to a Nabataean king's daughter. And Herodias is married to his brother, Philip I. So what do they do? Well, they decide to get a divorce. So his, Herod's first wife goes back to her father. Her father actually declares war on Herod Antipas and actually beats him until the Romans have to come in and they have to stop it. Well, Herodias divorces her husband, Philip I, who is Herod Antipas's half-brother, so that way they can get married. Okay, so who is this girl? This girl's name is Salome. Salome is the daughter of Philip I. I'm having trouble keeping these things separate, just like you. She is the daughter of Philip I and Herodias from the first wife. So this makes her, uh, Salome Herod Antipas' daughter and niece. She comes in and dances, which from the context was probably a seductive dance. And she is a teenager. So she goes and asks her mother, what do I need to do? Well, she says, have John the Baptist killed because John the Baptist had been getting on her nerves greatly. Well, when Salome grows up, Salome grows up and marries Philip II, Philip the Tetrarch, who is her great uncle. So this means if you put all of it together, Salome is Herod the Tetrarch's, I mean Herod Antipas, stepdaughter and niece, and this makes Salome Herodias' daughter, sister-in-law, and aunt. All at the same time. This is a messed up family. 
I don't even have a category for that. But apparently neither did John the Baptist. Now what's fascinating about John the Baptist is these stories were known by everyone in the land. So this would be equivalent to some king or president in our country who is really, really immoral. Most people just say, that's just him. I'm not going to be concerned with it. Everybody else knows about it. You know, it's just who he is. He can just suffer his consequences eventually. But not John the Baptist. John the Baptist goes and he brings the word of God to bear in the life of an immoral person. Now the context is a little bit different because Herod Antipas is ruling over God's people. So just like the prophets of old, he goes and brings this to the king. Now remember that John the Baptist is Elijah who was to come. Do you remember the story of Elijah with Ahab and Jezebel? And you can see some of these contexts, some of these, the way that God's word is playing out over and over again, even with the Elijah who was to come. Now, John the Baptist's death, he is killed by a, a pagan king for no sins of his own, is a foreshadowing of the death of Christ. But what I want us to know here, or what I want us to see on top of this context, is the fact that the king was sorry that it happened. He was sorry. Look in verse 9. And the king was sorry. He recognized what he was doing was wrong. He had been confronted with the word of God. He knew that John was a righteous man and he was sorry. But he cared more about the oaths that he had made. He cared more about his guests and he cared more about pleasing a teenage girl than he did about John the Baptist, the prophet, the man of God. So his conscience was bothered. His conscience was bothered that he had killed a righteous man. And so you say, well, how do you know that? Well, look up at the top. The top of the section here, verse 14, I mean, chapter 14, verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. Now, that is as far removed from reality as you can get. Of course, this is not Jesus. I mean, this is not John the Baptist. John the Baptist himself had said, I am not the one to come. There is one coming later whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He knew that he was not the Christ. Everyone else knew that he was not the Christ, but Herod said... This must be John the Baptist. Why do you think that is? I think it's because he was really and truly bothered in his conscience by what he had done. Notice that the prophet was killed, but his impact lived on. The word of God continued, even in the mind of an evil, evil man. Now Herod was a weak man who cared more about the things that we mentioned than the life of a righteous man. But I want us to see something here. Jesus bookends... This entire section, verse 1 and verse 12. Look at this. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, okay? And his disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. Matthew is not allowing us to take our gaze off of Christ for very long. He is still showing that Jesus is still the hero of the story. Even though John the Baptist is named, even though John the Baptist was a man who did not deserve to die that way, Jesus was still the king. It's curious to me that he says that whenever uh, these things uh, from the king, right, these things that he had promised, the king was sorry in verse 9. He called him king when he was acting the most unkingly. I think there is a bit of irony here between King Jesus and King Herod. But what I want us to see is that this man was sorry for his sins, and yet he did not repent and believe the truth of who Christ was. For salvation. So there's four practical truths that I want us to see from this. Two for non-believers, two for believers. The first is, it is possible for you to be astonished and even knowledgeable about Jesus and yet still be totally lost. It is possible for you to be astonished and even knowledgeable about Jesus and yet still be totally lost. You believe that Jesus existed? Very well. So to say, so do the demons, and they shudder. Think of the modern liberal scholars of today who will believe that there was, in fact, a Jesus. They will believe that Jesus actually walked the earth. They will think about a Jesus. They will teach about a Jesus who taught good things, who had a good sense of right and wrong, who actually changed the world because he was a great person. You think about the liberal scholars. But think about those who believe the lies of a cult, even in our own community. 
It is possible for you to be astonished at Jesus and knowledgeable about Jesus and still be totally lost. Look at the Nazarenes. You could not have known Jesus more intimately than the Nazarenes did, and yet they were still totally lost. The second thing, it is possible to be confronted by the truth of God's Word and be sorry for your sins and still be totally lost. Let me say that again. It is possible for you to be confronted with the truth of God's Word and be sorry for the things that you have done and still be totally lost. Feelings of guilt about actions without faith in Christ accomplishes nothing. Let me say that again. Feelings of guilt, without, of guilt about actions that you have committed without faith in Christ accomplishes nothing. I have talked to so many lost people who are genuinely sorry for the things that they have done in their life. It does not mean that they are saved. Christians, we cannot conflate a sense of right and wrong with salvation. Notice that the moral, the seemingly moral people of Nazareth who are attending synagogue to hear God's word preached and the evil King Herod, they end up in the same condition, unbelief, and both of them are headed for hell. So remember, it's not the amount of sin in our life that secures our eternal destiny. It is whether or not we believe in Christ as revealed in the Bible for salvation. The third thing and the fourth thing, these two things are for Christians. Christian, listen to these stories and understand that we can do everything right and people still not accept the message of the gospel. Let me say that again and I want you to hear it big, plain and straight as Adrian Rogers used to say. We can do everything right and people still not accept the message of the gospel. We as Christians are very quick to blame ourselves, aren't we? If I would have just said this better, if I would have just thought this better, if I would have just had more time, if I would have just prayed more, if I would have done this, if I would have done that, I'm not saying that we shouldn't study to show ourselves approved a workman who does not need to be ashamed. I'm not saying that we shouldn't say the right things. I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray fervently for the lost because both of those things are in the New Testament. But listen, you can pray fervently for the lost and you can say exactly the right thing and have these people reject the message of salvation. Remember that salvation is a work of God. Salvation is a work of God. We cannot convert anyone. We cannot convert anyone. Listen, if it were possible for us as a church to convert everyone in Spurger, don't you think we would do it? Like We would do that. But it's not our job. It's a work of God. Our job is to share the gospel. The Holy Spirit regenerates the heart. You understand that salvation is a work of God. Look at these two passages. If they rejected the message from Christ and from John the Baptist, then we should not be surprised when they do not accept it from us. So, we can do everything right and people still reject the message of the gospel. The second thing is we can do everything right and still suffer greatly. I want you to hear this in the midst of all of this craziness that we're living in. Listen, Christians can still get COVID. Christians can still be persecuted. It's happening everywhere at all times, all across the globe right now. And it doesn't mean that God is not pleased with them. We can do everything right and still suffer greatly. Remember what Jesus said. There is no one greater than John the Baptist in the entire Old Covenant. He was the prophesied forerunner of the Messiah. He was the Elijah who was to come. He had disciples. He was discipling people. He had a thriving ministry. He was standing in front of people with the word of God, bold enough in his faith and convictions to confront the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, to confront King Herod himself in his sin. This was God's man. And he was killed. He was killed. But not even in a valiant, heroic way. We've all seen stories, right, where you see like the mighty knight and if the main character dies in the movie, like he dies as he is, as he is swinging his sword with one final act of, 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 of strength, right, betraying the, the evils of the world and he is fighting. What about John the Baptist? He's in prison and he's killed over an oath given by a drunk king trying to please a teenager at a birthday party. The party was happening, 
Everybody got drunk. King Herod said, I'll give you whatever you want. He was killed, and the party went on. How anticlimactic is that? I mean, we're so used to hearing this story that some of the shock has worn off. But place yourself in the first century. Like, all of these things were true about John the Baptist. You read in the Old Testament about John the Baptist. Like, he's not just a prophet. He was prophesied about. He was Jesus' forerunner. He said, he must increase, I must decrease. There was no one more humble, more great than John the Baptist. Killed over a foolish oath by a drunken evil king trying to impress a teenager. For what? Seems like this is pointless. And from a worldly perspective, it would be. But... Christian, we must never forget that this is not our home. This is not our home. This is not John the Baptist's home. Listen, the Bible doesn't say anything about John the Baptist as he is being received into heaven. But don't you know that when he walked in, he heard, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. John the Baptist might have said, you know, I wanted to continue to minister. Like I was in prison and all I wanted to do was tell people about Jesus. He said, I know my son and you did well. You did well. See, this is not our home. Our hope is not here. Our reward is not here. We can never expect our reward in this life. John the Baptist received rewards, but it wasn't here. He was a poor man from an obscure place, dressed in camel's hair, eating locusts and wild honey, proclaiming the glory of the Christ who was to come. He lost his life, but as soon as he did, he stepped into the glories of heaven. You see, his hope was not here, and our hope isn't here. Suffering, our suffering, sometimes our suffering is not God's displeasure with us. Now, I know and I understand and, and I will say yes and amen that God disciplines in us in our sins, and we are all sinners, I, and I know that. But God's punishment is discipline is always redemptive. We talked about that on Wednesday night. But sometimes our suffering is not the product of God's displeasure with us. It is in actuality because we are doing exactly what God wants us to do. Our suffering is not because God is mad at us. We are suffering because we are standing squarely in the will of God. May we all be as bold as John the Baptist in our workplaces. May we all be as bold as John the Baptist in our homes and in our communities. May we fix our hope on heaven and remember that our reward is there. I don't know where you are today. Perhaps you are someone who is astonished by Christ and you have even heard his wisdom and you were saying, yes, he is something. Maybe you have heard about all of the conversions of these Christians and you were saying, yes, that is something. But you have not believed on him for salvation. You are still hoping to be good enough to make it into heaven. Or perhaps you are believing in a Jesus that you have invented. Look at the Nazarenes. They were stuck, they were hardened in their unbelief. Perhaps you're a person who says, well, I'm sorry for the things that I've done. Then I hope that's good enough. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. You know what? I'm not perfect. I'm a human. And, and, and to, to, to forgive is, is divine, and to sin, to err, is human. You know what? I'm, I'm a human, and God's just going to have to remember that I'm, I'm sorry for the things I do, but I can't help it. And, and you know what? I'm just going to hope that's good enough. King Herod was sorry. He was sorry that he had John killed. But you know what? King Herod is burning in hell today. Listen, I want to encourage you, if you don't know Jesus Christ today... This Christ of the Bible. You need to repent of your sins and you need to come to Him for salvation. Come to Him for salvation. Maybe you're a Christian here today and you have been sharing the gospel. You have been living that life of faith. And it just seems like people are not accepting the message of salvation and you're becoming disheartened and you're thinking, I must be doing something wrong. You can't save anyone. Only God can save someone. 
you keep sharing the gospel. You keep on living that life of faith. And you allow the, the repercussions, the consequences to fall with God. Remember, if they rejected Jesus' words and they rejected John the Baptist, we can't expect that they're going to accept us. Maybe you're someone who is suffering right now. And you've been thinking to yourself, well, surely God's mad at me. That's the only way to explain this. I'm suffering and surely God must be mad at me. Well, if you're sinning, He may be disciplining you. That's true. If you have unrepentant sin in your life, He may be disciplining you because He loves you. But your suffering is not always directly tied to your own sin. Sometimes you'll do everything right. You will be as faithful as you can. And bad things will still happen. But when it happens, remember, this is not our home. This is not where we will receive our reward. Wherever you are today, I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. And then we're going to have a few minutes just to respond. Miss Kathy's going to come up and play. If you're not a Christian here today, listen, you know. You know you're playing religion. You know that you, you are just hoping that you'll be good enough that God will somehow just forgive your sins outside of Christ. Listen, if you don't know Jesus today, you are a member, a citizen of the kingdom of Satan and you are headed for hell. Come to Him for salvation. If you don't understand what that means, come and talk to me. Come and talk to Brother Dustin. We would love to talk to you about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. If you are a Christian here today, listen, pray for those who are suffering. Pray for those who are lost. But don't waste this time. Let's use these few minutes and let's go before the throne of grace. And let's bring our prayers to God Himself. Let's pray this morning. Our Father in Heaven, God, we thank You for Your Word. Father, we thank You that we can see these, these stories, these principles, these truths from Your Word that are applied directly to our lives. And we are reminded that Your Word is active. It is sharp and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. And Father, we are reminded that Your Word does not return void. Father, we pray that You would shape us and mold us today according to Your Word. Father, for those who don't know You, who are stuck in their unbelief, Father, we pray that You would regenerate their hearts. Father, we pray that you would make them new creations. God, we pray that they would respond in repentance and faith. Father, we pray that they would be added to the kingdom today. Father, this morning we hope that we have done all things for your glory. God, is our aim to be pleasing to you with our lives, with our thoughts, and with our mouths. Father, we love and thank you. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen.